effort to me is something that doesn't take talent. All of us have spent all these years doing this, but I'm still up early, at it late, and I see the people that do that, and it's not their company. They don't have options or units, but they enjoy what they do. And so for me, effort will dominate you know, most other categories, but there's a leadership quality in them. And there's a lot of managers, cliche, but there's not a lot of leaders. But to me, it's effort. That doesn't take talent. Well, it's up to the point, listeners. It's your biz boy, Chris. That's, uh, that, that means your boy, in case you didn't know. For anybody that might be uh, older than me listening to this podcast. Can I say that? No, oh, I just did. Anyhow, this episode is an absolute banger. This is one of the highlights of Rhino X 2024 is our Legends panel. It's so cool that I can bring all these people together in one room and they don't just speak, they stay and work alongside those in attendance, but they put on a fantastic panel. One of the best Legends panels we've had to date with Ken Goodrich, Dave Geiger, Frank DeMarco, Mary Jean Anderson, it's great to have her on the panel, uh, Ken Haynes, and I know there's one more. Oh yeah, we have Mr. Wyatt Upwards for the first time on the panel, but. The audience asked some fantastic questions about business, some of the challenges that they're facing and how to get solutions to it, and then just the industry overall. So enjoy this episode with the legends of the trades from Rhino X 2020. Oh. I started the business 30 years ago, and for 15 years, we were just a ma and pop shop with my wife and I. Bouncing around between zero, well, not zero, started at zero, uh, but bounced around two million and under, and uh, and her doing the books. And then uh, about 15 years ago, 15 years ago, we went from 1.5 million and just grew over 15 years to, to 125 at Utah organically. And then uh, we retired my wife about three years ago, three and a half years ago. and. And so, did did we ever think we weren't going to make it? Yeah, all the all the time. <laughs> so, but we kept going to events like this and kept going to other companies, uh, companies that were bigger than us, like uh, companies out in Denver. We're we're out of Utah, so we we would drive from Utah to to Denver and see Plumline. I know Plumline's with the Wrench Group now, but they were six million back then. They were bigger than us, and we would spend a few days with them and go on, go on ride-alongs and. They would share things with us, and we we would we would be intimidated a little bit, and then we'd we'd come back and implement and become better and better and better, and so doing the you know doing the right thing and improving day by day uh, grows a pretty awesome pretty awesome business for all of us. I think it's a great question, and and if somebody if you were to ask me ten years ago, do you ever think you'd be the CEO of a business that's approaching two billion a year in revenue? I would say uh, no. Yeah, not, not my wildest dreams, nor would I be qualified to do it. Um, I'm an HVAC guy by trade, as a technician, that's how, I, that's how I come up, no college, no college degree. But I think for me, what, what really, and again, I go back to our group, we, we've got such incredible operators, people that are a lot smarter than me, and I learned a long time ago, and it's come up a couple times uh, today, and that is, you know, find great people, find great people, I've never been afraid to hire someone who's smarter than me. In fact, I'm attracted to that. You can't, you can't pretend to know it all. Uh, you gotta surround yourself with great people. You gotta be open to be challenged. And if you do that, you get better and, 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 and uh, you're more successful in the end. And so for me, that's, that's, uh, that's helped a lot. And you know, just fortunate that we've, and, and the way we operate, it's very collaborative, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a collaborative group. They work together, we share a lot. We don't always agree. Right, and never going to always agree, and that's and that's good. And so, uh, uh, conversations can be spirited, and uh, but at the end of the day, we're all on the same team, and and we march together. You know, when you when you walk out of the room, uh, and that's been that's been a big benefit for Wrench. Uh, and again, it just comes down to just partnering with the right folks, um, and that's what we focused on. I agree with that for sure. Um, what I would add to that is. When I ran a $2 million company, I had no idea how I could run a $5 million. And when I was at $5 million, 10 seemed like crazy. And as it went on and on, I realized that all of us have more potential within ourselves than we believe. And if you just believe in yourself and surround yourself with great people, everything kind of works out. And uh, I don't know how that I, I got that, but through seeing other people do it, I figured if they could do it, I could do it. 
And I just every day went to work trying to say, how can I make this better? Um, how could I help somebody in the business? How could I help a customer? How, how could we grow as a team every single day? And things just happen. <laughs> so I believe that we all have way more potential within us than we, we understand. Great. Thanks, panel. Hey, Mike. Oh, you going to ask the question or is Mike going to ask it? All right, you're in. You're up. So our, our businesses are pretty dependent on financing. Right? Uh, there's a lot of big jobs that we got to get financed, right? HVAC companies uh, you know, depend on financing. And you just see this market with financing, the rates changing consistently, dealer fees changing, um, tightening financing in general. So, like, how do you guys see this playing out with, uh, you know, the green skies, service, uh, any of the finance companies, I guess, right? I feel like every other week we're changing around. We're doing different p packages. There's new stuff. It's, like, never-ending kind of game happening right now and uh wonder what your perspective is on overall financing in general and the impact it's going to have throughout the rest of this year if it's going to get tighter it's going to get harder and if dealer fees are going to keep climbing yeah yeah yes i mean i yeah i i think we've all had to play this game we all of us have probably cut deals where you know the rate was going to be affected and it was going to cost you more and i have to change those packages but you know, the reality is, um, you know, I, I don't know that actually, you know, we, we use Green Sky Service Finance, um, Good Leap, but I don't think the owner of Green Sky wants to own Green Sky, so they're just going to run the rate, so let's just start there. Uh, that's okay. Um, it, it's complex. I mean, you're exactly right. We're financing a ton. All I'm sure all these companies are doing a ton of financing. I hope that the rate game is over. You know, I think we all do. So at least that'll quiet it a bit. But then it's tightening on who they're going to lend and, and credit score and who they're willing to take. So I, th I think we're farther, uh, you know, we're further down the road than we've been with all the stuff, Aaron, you know, with the rates, hopefully. Um, but it is tricky. It, it's tricky. I mean, we're, we're in a, uh, you know, monthly and quarterly, and we're watching our you know, dollars on that uh, spend, you know, like a hawk because they can get out of control really quick. But I agree with Ken, yes. I mean, it's just, it, it's a pain. I don't see it being any less of a pain and nobody has a good solution. Uh, but the, the, the lending is continuing to tighten. We're seeing the percentage drop on approvals, et cetera. Uh, not, nothing new that we're seeing, unfortunately. You know, I never understood why we pay dealer fees and car dealers get paid to originate fees. <laughs> we should have asked Nick Staben that, I guess, but we, uh, it always rubbed me the wrong way. We originate a lot of, a lot of loans and, and do a lot of marketing to get those loans. I feel like we should get paid, not pay, but it hasn't worked so far. <laughs> um, I think one piece of advice I would give is when you're, when you pick a offering, limit your offerings to three or four. Don't let the, Comfort consultants have a whole wide variety of plans because it's too hard, hard to manage and costs get, get, get out of hand. And, and when they, you are offering 0%, it's probably more important now than ever, make sure that the comfort consultant is, is paying part of that, that fee so it's not randomly giving it to everybody that can stroke a check. I think financing is something we have to continue to do, right? And um, so we just did the same thing. We limited, well, we always had three, but we, we changed up our programs and retrained our people to um, green sky lower interest loans um, that were lower interest to, our, to us. So yeah, I would say, you know, you've got to do it. It is what it is. It's not going anywhere. Uh, hopefully down, closer to the election. Uh, but um, I think you just have to Sadly, build it into the price and retrain your people with lower um, interest rates that we'll be paying out or percentages we'll be paying out. I think they covered it. Great job. All right. Hey, Ken, you asked the question to Wait, the... Wait, let me, let me say something to your partner here real quick. Sorry. So just get, you know, back in the Great Recession, 8 through 10, 11... Um, you know, we were, we were dealing with uh, approval rates in the high 60s, 67, 68. We were making it work, 
but you got to understand how that affects the closing rate. You got to understand that number, how it affects your closing rate, and how the whole machine works, right? So you're going to have to do more jobs or lean out, lean out, do more jobs, create other packages that are uh, less expensive for the customer, rebuild the air conditioner instead of installing a new one, things like that. But you know, pay attention to that number because that's that's the thing you keep your eye on, right? The approval rate. The other Ken's going to go. I agree. And I think I'm not that close to the financing activity or numbers, but I know that uh, you probably all know better than me. I think we saw a little bit of headwind on, on, on rates and, and, and the underwriting. But I don't, and I, and I agree with, with Ken, as I look back on 2023 and some of the, you know, leading indicators that would, that would tell you there's, there's some challenges, it would be, it would be your close rates. And we didn't see across the portfolio in aggregate really a big drop in close rates. So that's good. And the other one is average order. So average order is either up some or flat. Uh, and close rates also where they need to be would tell you that people, while finance rate costs have gone up, people are still finding ways to pay for it, right? Whether it's going on their credit card or they're paying cash or writing a check, whatever the case may be. Uh, but it's definitely gotten it's definitely gotten a little bit tougher. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a prediction and say that uh, this year gets a little gets a little better. You know, we also dealt with with you know challenges with 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 demand and lack of right or sense of urgency. And when people have time to make decisions and wait, uh, it, it you know it tends to hurt a little bit. So my prediction is is it, it's 24 is going to be still tough, but it's going to be better than 2023, and there'll, there'll be a little bit of a little bit of relief on the uh, uh, financial front around rates. I'll probably be totally wrong, but that's why I got a 50-50 chance of being right. You should have saw their face when I said they, that we covered it. You should have saw them. They both gave me the stare. Stare down. Sure, Ken. Um, you asked the influencer panel how they saw the business or the industry evolving over the next five years and then 10 years. And they talked about disruption, maybe commoditizing pricing, possible exodus as people get private equity money. I just wanted to hear your guys' additional insights of where you guys think it's gonna go in the next five to 10 years. Well, on that, on that particular question, I agree with Tommy. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that a lot of our business is gonna head to um, the internet sales. I just went out to Ohio and saw a guy who has a $200 million a year online HVAC company. So let's extrapolate 200 million in, in equipment cost these days, average prices. It's probably close to a billion in retail business that he's plucked out by shipping these units out. There's a million square foot of, of inventory. It's amazing looking. Uh, and there's another three or four of them like that. So let's just say for this conversation, there's five of those at 200 million or around there. That's a billion dollars times five. There's five billion or I don't know what, it, you know, every, every week people tell our, our industry, our market is bigger or smaller than I hear, but let's just pick 100 million. It's five points already off that just on online business. I mean, it's, it, it was pretty spectacular. The guy... That, uh, the month that I went and visited him, he had sold uh, $3 million of Resnor heaters. Three million bucks, and they're, you know, they're not that expensive, but to, to give you an idea, you know, I think a lot of business is gonna head that way, and, and we gotta start ready to be, start getting ready to be labor brokers of some sort. Um, in San Diego, we, I can see it in package units, like here, Phoenix, perfect. You dump your package units on every roof. Um, San Diego wasn't built that way. and that, well, I'm from San Diego. It wasn't built that way. We were built with no air conditioning originally and uh, heat only. And so I, I know that it's coming, and I agree 100% it's coming. And I think we're probably going to have to make money on selling something and then going out and selling all the extras to get it sold. That's the direction I'm thinking. I'm going to disagree. I don't think that's for, no, not with you necessarily, okay. with Tommy. <laughs> Mello, I don't see him. Look, I don't, I don't think, 
are things going to change? Are more people going to buy online through e-commerce? Sure. Why can't we participate in that? I believe that we will always own the last mile. You can't, you can't live without what we all do. Uh, and so, sure, maybe the manufacturers may want to sell direct, but they can't install it. Who's going to install it? So we, we, we control our destiny. I mean, if you want to, if you want to go that route, you I mean, you could, you could agree to that, but I still think that people are going to come there. It's, it's a $180 billion space, residential, service, break, fix, replacement, all three trades, it's 180 billion, it's massive. Tens and tens of thousands of contractors. We've gotta be smart, we've gotta figure out a way to get to the customer, we've gotta find a way to own the customer, things are gonna change, but I don't think we all get squeezed out and it's commoditized, I just don't think that's where it's going. And when you look at the margins, when you look at some of these big businesses that wanna get in, look, one, this is, these, I mean, I don't have to tell anyone in this room, these businesses are not easy to run. They're really, really hard. Really, 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 really hard. Um, and so not easy to duplicate. Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, but we've got, to find a, we've got to find a way to, to, to own the customer. Uh, and e-commerce is a big piece. I, I agree with e-commerce. I think that's where it's going. I think it's more of, I struggle with, are people gonna write or you know, give you a, a credit card and say, here, let me, let me go through everything and here's my, here's, here's your credit card, bill $15,000. I think it's more of a lead tool uh, than it is um, people transacting online. I could be wrong, but, but that's not five years down the road. I think that's way, way down the road. Um, I'll be on a beach somewhere with a drink and an umbrella in it, but I think that's a long way off, but I, I don't agree. I don't, I don't think it's commoditized. I just don't think we're going there. Is, are there disruptors? that we're gonna to have to be on the lookout for? Sure, but I don't think it's commoditized. What do you think it looks like in five years? Well, I'll tell you, what, I mean, I think more, more interesting and what's more relevant is how does this all look in five years? I mean, you've got anywhere between 60 and 100 private equity folks in this space now. It won't continue the way it is. You're gonna have people come together, they're gonna to merge, they will be bought out, there won't be as many. Uh, they won't be in it for the long game. Um, and I think the pace in which new come in will slow down. So I think, I think you'll see a transformation. Some will fail, I heard somebody say it. I mean, look, uh, models are different. Some models may be better than others, whatever that is, the right answer is there, uh, TBD. Uh, but I think platforms will come together to make bigger platforms. A couple may go public, potentially, maybe not. I think the bigger you get, it's tougher for private equity to come up with the cash. I mean, you know, these, these platforms get so big where private equity, frankly, can't write the checks. They just don't have the checkbooks to write, you know, $5 billion checks. Um, so I think that'll, that'll become difficult. So, there will, there will, I think, so I think the transformation is really around looking at these, these bigger platforms and all the platforms and how they all marry up in the end. I think the landscape looks a lot different over the next five years. I think that's probably more realistic of what's you know, ahead of us uh, in the next five years. I, I agree with all of you, especially what you're saying, Ken. Um, if we were deciding to be a platform or go with private equity right now, like today, I would not start a private equity platform at all with where things are. I would actually go with one of the one of the bigger bigger groups uh, that's going to be secure and not fold into another group because then I know what I know. Um, for instance, like a like a uh, Ken Haynes uh, Wrench group, uh, they're not going to fold in. At least I don't believe you'd be folding into some other group. So so I would pick uh, I would pick a, a group that 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 I felt was going to be. I would want to know what I'm signing up for. I'd want to know. Uh, I love what Nick Saban said, where he said, you know, he's given a commitment to those joining his team. Like, I'm going to be here in four years. I'm going to be here when you graduate. And those are the kind of questions I'd be asking is, are you going to be here in four years? What does this look like in four or five years? So great question, but I would not uh, start start the platform. In fact, I, I, I feel like we got into it just barely in time. Uh, it's been a lot more work. I, I think Ken Haynes... Uh, said said it was going to be a, all these guys told me it was going to be a lot of work, but anyway, it's been a lot of work, right, Jeremy? We put putting a lot of hours in, but uh, yeah, that's my two cents. Yep. 
I think also industry specifics are going to flourish and maybe some of the others will drop away. And maybe all that have industry experience will be buying them, I don't know. But I see those that don't have industry experience that have jumped in and bought all these companies up, they don't get it. And I think that some of those will fall to, away to other groups. Um, but I also, Paul Kelly and I were talking at lunch about this and we were both of the same opinion that it is going to get harder for the middle size company um, to struggle. I think the big groups are gonna stay there as Paul said, they're going to have to stay there um, because of Amazons and all this that's coming out. And the one guy trucks are going to be there, and the guys in the middle are probably going to have to go one direction or the other. Any thought on that? No. <laughs> well, the, the only thing I would add to it is online sales are coming, like like Ken says, and we just need to be a part of it. We need to change the paradigm thinking and, and be in the game. I got, I got to, and I got to say one more thing too, just because I feel like I need to defend private equity for a minute. I know private equity gets a, a bad rap and I, I could be honest and I, I think if you went down the line here and asked everyone, what's it like working with your sponsor? I think generally speaking, everyone would say good people. I think, and sometimes they get confused with VC money, venture capitalist money and private equity money is two different things. Um, I've got three sponsors, and I love them. I mean, I just, they're incredible. I mean, they let us run the business. I think we all have a lot of leeway to do what we, we think we do. They don't, get, they don't understand the business, right? I mean, they're, they're smart people, right? They're all, all these Harvard degree guys and gals and stuff. They're, they're, they're great business people, but they don't, they nev they've never run anything. They've never run anything. And they certainly don't know what we do. Uh, and so they need us. But, but not all private equity is treated equal. I get, I get that. But generally speaking, they're, it's, it's, they're not this big bad wolf coming in and, and screwing things up for everyone. Uh, they're investors, right? And they want to make money, want to get a return. Uh, but they're reasonable, most of them. Maybe some other, some other opinions on that, perhaps. But. we got about time for two more questions. So I'm going to try to get two more squeezed in if that's possible. So Josh, you'll go in and then Steve. <laughs> what would you guys say is um, some of the most defining leadership behaviors that you look for in employees or people that you want to promote to managers or um, leaders within your groups or your companies? Because we all know that you know just because they're a good tech doesn't make them a good manager and so forth. I would say smart, humble, um, a leader that does not put himself first all, all the time and somebody that wants to win. I, I don't think you're going to hear a bunch of different answers. I think. <laughs> agree with Dave, you know, you're, I think for me, it's effort. To me, you know, what's their moral compass? What's their character like? Um, do I see something in them? And we have to do this in all these organizations for next level management, but effort to me is something that doesn't take talent. Yeah, I'm, you know, all of us have spent all these years doing this, but I'm still up early at it late. And I see the people that do that, and it's not their company. They don't have options or units, but they, they enjoy what they do. And so for me, effort will, will dominate you know, most other categories. But they, they, have to, they, have, they have to just be, have a, there's a leadership quality in them. And there's a lot of managers, cliche, but it, there's not a lot of leaders. Um, so for me, it's, do I see them doing the right thing? humble, smart, um, are they hungry to go out and get it? But to me, it's effort. That doesn't take talent. It's, we work hard doing the, running these businesses and those people stick out to me. So it's probably the only other thing I'd add from Dave is effort. And, and I'll, I'll agree with both these comments and say, add this, that you know when I'm, when I'm looking at a, a current employee to see if we need to move, that we if we can move them up, or we're interviewing her for a position, you know, just like the coach said, discipline. You know, what do they look like? They're disciplined. Uh, you know, dig into that. Do they have a routine about their life? Do they do they go to the gym? Do they have specific things that they uh, no no non negotiables in their life and such, so they can keep on a path and a good routine for the organization. 
Yeah, we, we look for hard work ethic, but we start looking for those leaders and those future managers in the interview process. So we're very slow to hire. Uh, we, we, we have a line of people wanting to come in, especially now that things slowed down a little bit. Isn't that great? So uh, it seemed like two or three years ago, no one, no one could find anybody to come work for them. And, they were, they, and, uh, and uh, now, now they, everybody wants marketing. But, uh, so it's pretty awesome. We just look for that leadership at the beginning. Um, at NER Utah, which we grew organically over the last 15 years, uh, they, we, uh, we, I believe about 90% of the managers there actually came from within. It didn't, and uh, a lot of those were hired knowing that they had more potential than what we were hiring them in for. So, uh, but we also grew them. We, we give people a little bit of opportunity of leadership in the different trainings we have each week, and we just see who's standing out. Um, we, our managers are really good at, at uh, getting getting people to participate in in our in our trainings um, and, in, and in those meetings so that we can just see who's doing what in the presentations, who's, who's doing those things that a manager would do before they're actually given that title, who's being a leader before they get that title, and that, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I, I think it was, it was maybe some other attributes that I look for uh, would be you know, honesty, integrity, uh, empathetic, great listeners. Uh, I think on the, on the honesty front, it's, I think where a lot of leaders struggle are sitting down and, and having the tough conversations, having to sit down and deliver bad news, or be straightforward and honest with people as to what, what they're, what's not going well, right? Sit them down, sit her down, look them in the eye, and have that tough conversation. Uh, I think people, people shy away from that. It's not fun to do. It's tough for some. And so I think being honest with people. No one, no one, should, ever, no one should ever be terminated. If anyone's ever surprised that they get fired, that's a problem. It means you you failed as a leader. Should never be surprised. Shouldn't be hearing it for the first time. And so, I think being honest with people is, is one of the most important thing and, and super critical. So, but I think and I agree with everything else. I think everybody hit it. I agree with everything, and I think what Nick Saban said really resonated with me. And it's it's true. It's in the recruiting process. If you're really going to grow a team, you better spend time making sure you hire the right people. Agree can waste a lot of time and money when you're just getting somebody to fill a spot. It just doesn't work in most cases. Okay, well, I, um, I guess I have the last question. First of all, uh, on behalf of Matt Janes and myself from K-Post and Brad Belden from uh, Belden Roofing, we are hugely appreciative for being here with you guys today and seeing this side of the industry and the services side of the industry since we're in the roofing side of the industry. Um, we are in the probably first or second inning of the PE world compared to you guys being in the sixth, seventh, eighth inning of it. Um, from what I heard today, it looked like it was a little bit more the eighth inning. Um, but uh, just tremendous amount of gratitude for the invite. Thank you so much, Chris and, and your team. My question is around the feds. The feds have been sending a lot of mixed signals about interest rates. We've seen a lot of things happening with the economy uh, c coming back from COVID, supply chain, et cetera. And then now we see what's happening in Europe and other parts of the world uh, with their economies. Do you guys think, uh, and ladies, think that it matters who the president is and will the economy change in November if there's a change of presidency? <laughs> okay, I know there's a political side to this, but uh, this from a business side of it. First of all, I hope we go into extra innings. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> so I've been doing this a while, and I chose to make money whoever's in, in the seat, and we'll figure it out, you know. I have my political opinions, but I'll leave that for another time. But, you know, I really believe that if it is to be, it's up to me and the team to make it, make it happen, and I'm not going to get caught up in all that stuff. Um, I agree. I've never really paid much attention to it, and um, and I never let it affected me affect me, and I just kept pulling right through what I needed to do to, to make the business. And, and, and most of this comes from my younger years. Um, I I guess I maybe just because I'm a little older and I'm watching CNN more or something or Fox News or whatever that you know I'm more cognizant of what's going on. It's irritating, but uh, I will say that. Most of my career, it I just 
took the tack that it doesn't matter who's in that seat, I'm going to figure a way to adapt to the current situation and profit from my business. I would, I would, I would agree. I, I don't think it, it, you know, maybe, you know, in the short term, political years sometimes have an impact on the business. It may, you know, they take over, they take over the advertising, right? It makes marketing perhaps a little bit more expensive and a little less inventory. Um, people do get a little squirrely, not knowing who's going to be in the White House, and then whoever it is, everything, you know, goes away. So I don't, long term, I don't think it's a big issue. I do, I do think, depending upon which party gets in, you know, they have different things they're focused on. Um, we're dealing with a lot of regulatory changes in the HVAC space, and it's also bleeding into plumbing and, and electrical. Certainly that, that impacts us, maybe in a good way as well, right? I mean, we've got the phase out of 410A that's coming, and that's driving prices up this year as a result. So there are some, there are some consequences for, for, you know, the policymakers and policies they, they uh, enforce. And so, but, but, long, but generally speaking, I, I, don't, I don't think we get too concerned about it. It is what it is. You've got to deal with it and uh, march on. Okay, that's that. Well done. All right, let's give a big round of applause.